Welcome to Authentic Living with Roxanne, a place where we have conscious conversations about things that really matter in our lives. And now, here's your host, Roxanne Derhage. This was such a great interview that we decided to turn it into a two-part series. Be sure to tune in next week for part two, so you don't miss out on the amazing content. Hi everyone, it's uh, Roxanne Durhage of Authentic Living with Roxanne. Today I have a, I would say a friend now because we spent almost a year together um, in a writing group and her name is Christy Scarrow. So Christy, thanks for coming on. I know Christy and I have not met in person yet. I'm mm-hmm. going to assume probably what time we will, um, but we joined a, a writing group in uh, when COVID started and of course, both of us, my book is still in the edit stage, but hers has been published and put out to the world. So an amazing accomplishment. So Christy, thanks for coming on. Christy is a specialist um, on conflict and um, her, her book is called Truth Warriors. And we're going to talk a little bit about conflict, something that I think most of us kind of are familiar with. I would say some of us do it um okay sometimes and we're but we're always needing to to learn the skills necessary uh to kind of mitigate the outcomes of when conflict goes bad so thanks for coming on so how have you been good thanks Rosa Alexander. it's so good to see you again as you said it was so nice i saw you almost every day for for three months straight and uh, it was an amazing group of people obviously an opportunity to bring our books to life together and support one another so yeah no so excited to be chatting with you about definitely something I'm passionate about conflict and supporting people through it and and as you said uh, and I and I don't think of conflict as a negative thing like some people do um, but I see it as kind of a spectrum so there's there's challenges where we have conflict and there's definitely strategies to get through it there's other times I think we actually need a little bit more conflict so excited to chat with you about it today. So let's talk about, um, I was looking up just to kind of, to kind of get a bit of a benchmark and the numbers are staggering. Like in the U S the stat is $359 billion yearly that they're lost. And in Canada, they figure it's about 2 billion. Does that, does that make sense when you kind of, with kind of the companies or, or there's some of the numbers that you've heard kind of being a specialist in the field? Yeah, well, I mean, you're right. We, we see conflict showing up in so many different ways. And obviously, what, with what's happening with the pandemic and mental health issues really coming to the, to the forefront, rightfully so, just given the extreme stress we're all under in this, in this new world, uh, it's not surprising that conflict much more easily arises. So the fact that conflict is, is coming up in the workplace, the, the fact that we're trying to find strategies to address it, um, the fact that you know, HR professionals and leaders are trying to find ways. In fact, I think there's in some ways even more of a resistance to avoid difficult conversations, which I believe is actually an escalation to conflict. So one of my favorite books, one of the inspirations for my book was Leanne Davies, who wrote The Good Fight. And it's all about this idea of conflict debt. And that when you don't address conflict, it actually causes you know, greater frustrations, escalates it, people cause resentment, there ends up being side conversations. So it's not surprising to me that we're seeing such staggering numbers in, in um, issues being as a result of conflict. So how did, how did you get into this kind of work? Did you decide like it, as a little girl, I wanna work with people to work with conflict? How did you, what was your path to kind of become, uh, becoming an expert? I, yeah, I don't think it was that direct. I think it's interesting. I, I've always been very passionate about, um, I, I, I think I'm a natural problem solver. And I think mm-hmm. as a result of that moving into that sort of le- leads me towards conflict situations, because a lot of times the problems result from, you know, misaligned expectations or, and so, and I also love the idea of psychology. I minored in psychology in school and, and frankly, probably wish I had majored in it because compared to business, I loved it so much more. And so the behavior of, of individuals was fascinating to me. And why do we, why does conflict exist? And then I really sort of dug in 
um, in, a, in, in learning more even about biases and how and belief. And I think it really came to a front the reason I wanted to write on it and speak on it was, um, it, you know, even a few years ago, just really came to, the, to this idea of we're so we're dividing more and more and more, right? It just feels mm-hmm. like that division gets keep getting worse, whether it's in our in our politics or through the racial tensions. And of course, as you know, we were both writing our books during uh, COVID and during a lot of the racial tensions that were happening and all of that. And that allowed me to sort of pour into it even more. But I think this idea of like, why are we so divided? And how do, why do people hold so tightly to their beliefs? And I think it's still a nut I haven't totally cracked and I don't think anyone's fully done there, but I'm very passionate about sort of peeling that onion a bit more. Why is it that when we believe so strongly, I mean, we're seeing it right now with the vaccination and anti-vaxxer pushback, right? Why do people believe so strongly that they're completely unable to consider other perspectives? And that is such a source of conflict. So I think um, that's something I've always been passionate about. And I think it's just so many things have happened lately to kind of keep pushing against like why, you know, how, how, do, we, how do we solve this? How do we come together more as a community as a, independent of our beliefs, how can we not suspend our beliefs or allow different beliefs and, and move closer together and a better understanding of those different beliefs. So that's what I think I've always been passionate about. And I think mm-hmm. just lately I've been trying to really um, zone in on how to help others move through that. So let's talk about that because I mean, I've, I did um, a certificate in mediation when, uh, you know, I was working in corporate and I've done a fair amount of conflict resolution in my different roles. So what are some of the core things that keep someone stuck from getting the perspective of of another versus kind of being in the middle? Like what, what are some of the core things that you find are some of the differences? Well, and it comes back to that idea of of bias, which we all have, of course, you can't, you can't stop these natural human biases of, of we we form immediate opinions of people, you know, our beliefs become part of our identity as opposed to an actual perspective. And so I think it needs to start with that recognition or that awareness that it's going to, it's going to be there. And it's okay that I have these biases, it's, but I have to recognize them in myself. And I think what's made it even worse is this, you know, social media, I don't know if you've seen the show, The Social Dilemma, um, but that was fascinating to me because it's all about how social media, you know, it really takes what we believe and continues to develop that. So, you know, what what I type into Google, even in the first word, it fills in based on my history. And, and all and social media actually, you know, feeds the confirmation bias that we all have. So we're already attuned to go out for look for information that validates our opinion, um, but social media feeds it. So if I follow one person or I'm looking at one newspaper, I'm going to get the same perspective. And then it makes it really even harder for me to see an alternative perspective. So, so, so I have to be very purposeful about one recognizing that and even recognizing it in myself, because you can often feel this, you know, when someone confronts you with a belief that you don't agree with, your body actually physically reacts to that. And I think it's being attuned to those reactions and going, wait a second, why am I getting irritated? And this is the time, if you're able to have the willpower to do so, to go, let me just see if I can understand how they got to that perspective. You know, what makes them believe that? And and simply the understanding of it oftentimes resolves some of the conflict because it's about like, I may not agree with that perspective, but that doesn't mean I disagree with who you are. And I think right. that's, and that's, the, that's the, that's the rub, right? Because yeah. that's what oftentimes people get into. It's like, if I, if I um, like broccoli and you don't like broccoli, I feel like I need to like change your mind about broccoli. And if you don't see it my way, then I don't know if I like you. Yeah. That's yeah. kind of where conflict gets to versus, you know, okay, well, tell me more, right? Like to, to really, I, cre- I call it creating a gap versus, oh, she's just like that. So therefore I push her away a bit more versus kind of opening up the space to ask a bit more questions about why do you like broccoli? You know, yeah. what is it? And that then you- to build on that, I Roxanne, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's such an awesome analogy because to build on that, you not liking broccoli might associate, maybe, well, one, maybe you're one of those vegetarians that don't, you don't even like meat or may- and maybe you're one of those extremists that 
So we even infer like values and other things with opinions, right? Whereas you're like, oh, I just like broccoli. It's, you know, <laughs> and so I think that's the other thing is we make a lot of quick, quick judgment and assumptions and inferences about one thing you believe means that you believe this, this, and this. And that's mm-hmm. where we need to stop the, the, the natural jump that our brains make to associate certain things. So you have this belief, you must be this kind of person. And that's not the kind of person I am. So your values are like, you're not, I don't like you and I disagree with you and I need to change you because what you believe is wrong. Like it goes Mm -hmm. that quickly in our brains and it's, it's, it's natural, but it's, it's, I think starting to recognize that you you have to actually go, wait a second, I am reacting in this way. It starts with that self-awareness and the personal responsibility that I have a role in this just because, and because there's, it, my belief may not be right either, right? And I think that's the other thing is if we're, and, and even if my belief is right, maybe I have an opportunity to share a perspective or learn something new here. And sometimes I, you know, I found that, you know, in my role um, as a psychotherapist or, or just in, in consulting, I would be like, whoa, I don't see it like that at all. And I'm thinking on my body language, it's probably showing it, even though I'm going, oh, okay, wow, or whatever. So it's really also being aware. Um, sometimes you're trying to kind of keep your cool as well. And and your visceral, like you said, your visceral reactions kind of screaming at the other person on the other end. And then you're wondering, why are they responding like that? Because sometimes what we don't say comes out equally as loud as what we do say, right? Which could lead into the other part. Like you said, none of us like, you know, to get into having... Um, an altered or a different um, belief than somebody else. But unfortunately, I mean, we all have them, regardless of how homogeneous we are. There's always nuances of things, you know, if we didn't, or, you know, I'm Trinidadian, so I grew up with a different culture until I was 17. Then I moved here. Well, I'm female. Okay, well, you know, I've done this kind of jobs. Like we're writers, we're speakers, we're co- So we have a lot of people that we can kind of pile up and put in our subset that you get. And then Mm -hmm. if somebody's kind of out of it, it's like, what do I, you know, and I don't think we're, we think that we're that judgy, but we truly are deep down inside. Oh yeah. You know? And I think that's the thing people will probably say, I'm not, I'm not judgmental, but we, we all are. And we can't, we can't help it. I mean, our brains are wired because we just can't process all that information. We make snap judgments. And, and we make snap assumptions and then we build upon those assumptions, right? So um, if, if I believe, like if I'm meeting up with you for lunch and you're late and I hate people who are late and then you show up the one time, I might go, oh, she doesn't, she doesn't care about my time. And which is in reality, maybe there's, an, there's a very clear reason why you don't care about my time. But next time you're late, I'm like, see, she did not care at all about me. I'm not going to want to meet up with her again. She, you know, is an inco- thoughtful, thoughtless person. Like we go all that way quickly on really quick things. Now, of course, we don't do that for ourselves as easily as we do it for others. But that's the challenge is sort of breaking that moment of like, wait a second, why am I jumping to this? Mm-hmm. And I, I recently fell into a great way of, of testing assumptions that actually res- dissolve the conflict uh, or stop a conflict from happening in, in my work situation. So our, our business model is that we're all under Lighthouse 9. There's a number of consultants. We all run our own kind of client businesses as part of that. And so we hire one another with different specialties, which works well as a business model. So I was frustrated because I wasn't, um, one of my partners didn't hire me for a particular area, which I thought, hey, did, did she even consider me? And, and it's probably less about the fact that she didn't hire me, but more I wasn't sure why she had chosen the person she had chosen. And I started this dialogue in my head, like that, that other person didn't do any work and is yet getting to do this project. And, you know, I was like, that the work shouldn't even be his because he's not even doing like Anyway, I went a whole bunch of inner dialogue. And I thought, you know, what? I'm just ending up resenting my partner as a, with all these assumptions in my head. So I called her up and I said, listen, I don't want you to make any changes, but I have assumptions going on. And all I want to do is validate with them. So I self-declared, I think I'm making assumptions here and these are my assumptions. And she said, yeah, you're wrong. She said, you know what? He actually did this, this, and this to get this project. He actually has this expertise that you weren't aware of. And I was like, awesome. Thank you so much. I was so happy about that because in my head, I had all these things built up that made me angry at her choice. And in reality, they were the wrong assumptions. And I think, you know, declaring an assumption, 
I'm going to say that's high level technical, because I would say that a lot of people aren't held back by, by that vulnerability, which is really, you know, you're in a, like a consultative situation. This is a partner. So obviously you have a certain working um, capacity with each other and still even in that, but for you to declare an assumption to say, I've got some of those, can we chat about them? You know, I would say when you're coaching someone, do you find many people have that capacity or you're coaching them to get to that ability to be able to, to, to kind of hollow that assumptions or say it out loud? Yeah, I think that's one of the challenges. Well, one of the opportunities as coaches, right, is to be able to draw out what people are actually assuming those underlying ones and have them understand from themselves what might be the assumptions driving that belief. And so if, if they're having a frustration or a conflict, getting them to kind of think about, well, why do you think that is? Or why do you believe that? Or what mm-hmm. starts to get them to understand the, the assumptions that might be there? And then you can ask the question, how can you test that that's true? Mm-hmm. How do you know if that's true? And then they can think about ways. And, and to be honest, it was this, I, I wasn't sure how to have that conversation. I say I kind of fell into this approach. I'm like, I totally have to use this approach myself because <laughs> I kind of wasn't sure how to handle it. I'm like, I don't want it to seem like I'm just complaining because I don't actually, I had no expectation for her to change it. But yet I knew that if I didn't address it, then the, then the next time something happened in a similar way, I would be like, see, like she, she's not making the right choices or whatever would go around in my head. And I'm like, I want to stop that now because I could be, I mean, I really didn't think I was wrong, to be totally honest, but I thought if I get it out, then at least, so I, I think it, it, the more I can encourage people to do that again I'm not saying I'm the best always the best at it myself I think we all have these assumptions but I think it's pausing to go what if this is an assumption what if this isn't actually true how did I actually get to this belief like why do I believe this person is x y and z and it's maybe because they did this this and this and you can kind of go well is there another reason they might have done that and so it really is challenging that inner dialogue. And I think you're right. As coaches, it, it, we can ask the questions probably better than you can even do it yourself. Yeah, right? well, give me three facts to support the, that you know this this has happened. And people go, yeah. what do you mean? Well, and they give me subjective you know, reasoning. Oh, no, 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 no. I say hard facts. And they go, what? Try that again. <laughs> and then they go, oh, okay, no. I think that he did this because, no, no, no. Give me a fact. Yeah. Oh, and then when people start to really, and all of us, right, you know, our worlds, we have that subjective reality that it's based on so many things. So how do you parse that out? <laughs> um, and when you get into conflict, because guess what? At the end of the day, we're human beings, right? We want to protect and preserve. And what does the brain and the body do? It never yeah. fails us, right? Like, I mean, it's like, whoa, I identify that, therefore I have to take the step. And before you know it, you're kind of clamping down based on something that's happened before. And in Malcolm Gladwell's um, book, um, I've won- I'm not sure which, we talked about the thin slicing effect, right? Mm. Those snap decisions, you know, within, I forget what it was said, was six seconds or something. And it shows you how quickly we can intuitively assume something. And then, as, of course, when you're like, whether it's with your family or if you're working on teams, And you're like the cumulative effect. And I want to talk more about that is like, oh, I'm going to leave that one. And before I know it, it's like a, it's like a, you know, a blazing fire because the little things become cumulative and they can kind of gain momentum. So let's talk a little bit about kind of whether it's at home or at work. And let's say there's something kind of that's made you upset or made, you know, put you off. Um, what's the best way to consider approaching that? Like, even if I may not say, well, I prefer to leave this one. How do I make the decision whether to say, okay, that one I'm going to just leave, (laughs) but I can't do that all the time. What's, you know, how do I kind of decide what to go after and what to kind of make sure I follow through on? Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, as human beings, we're kind of conflict diverse by nature and that's okay because we want to have harmonious relationships. And as you said, you sometimes you are making the choice to not declare something, to not say something for the sake of that relationship. And the reality is you're probably more likely to do that for somebody you trust. You're like, well, that was an honest mistake. They're a good person. So I know they probably didn't, you know, weren't late on purpose. Uh, or someone you know less or, you, or they've already broken trust from you, you're more likely to, uh, to actually react and go, oh, see, I knew they weren't very considerate. Um, so I think it's one, you know, it's recognizing the context of it. So 
if you're in that situation, and as you already alluded to, that emotional reaction is really important. If you're in a situation where you know that conversation is going to escalate because you yourself are still feeling anger or resentment, then it might be not the time to have the conversation. Right. And, and the question becomes, if it's worth dealing with, it's probably more, is this a pattern? Do I feel it building? Is, is it now every conversation I have with them feels, I feel irritated. So um, that idea of that conflict debt building up, right? If every time my interactions now become more and more strained, and you're right, ideally you would have dealt with it with a little fire, but we don't tend to. We, we, <laughs> but if it starts to start to creep up before it gets to that big bonfire, that's the time to go, wait a second, every interaction feels frustrating with them. Or I've now decided that I've already put my judgment on this person. I've already said they're lazy. They don't care about me. Whatever it is, I've now gotten to the point where I've, I've labeled them as always being like this. Yeah, you're, and, you're always late or you're, yeah. you know, um, you're, you're always missing deadlines or you're labeling them. And then if I label someone, there's no possibilities of giving that person any opportunity to have me experience them in a different way. So all those absolutes too become something that I think when people start to think it through, they realize we're not always a certain way. We can often be, but to yeah. give the person <laughs> the opportunity to kind of have us experience that because if we're reacting to their behavior and we're just not giving them an out as well that 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 synergy could get developed as well thanks for tuning in to authentic living with roxanne creating the space for positive healthy change roxanne is a keynote speaker psychotherapist and coach to work with roxanne visit roxanderhajcom slash blueprint we'll see you next time on authentic living with roxanne